everyone. Welcome back to another exciting episode of the Spirit of Prophecy podcast. Really fired up about today's episode. I hope it is going to be an interesting one for you. I, I know what I want to communicate and express is very important, and I think it is very interesting. Whether or not I will make it interesting and educational, I don't know. Uh, sometimes I feel like the Lord gives me fantastic messages and I don't always preach them the greatest, uh, but uh, it doesn't change the fact the message is good. And I believe the message of this particular podcast is very important. Whether or not I make it interesting, that is to be seen. So bear with me because I have a lot I want to cover. And uh, what I want to talk about today, this is actually going to be re is very related to a subject I'm preaching on Sunday. On Sunday, uh, I, I just finished putting a message together called Learn Their Language. And um, I'm calling it that because um, we often hear people say, you know, missionaries, for example, if you're going to try to reach another uh, nationality, nation, you need to learn their language. Why? Well, if you're going to present the gospel to somebody, if you're going to get them believing on Christ, you have to be able to communicate with them. That's so important. And, but at the same time too, even within American Christianity, okay, there are all kinds of different beliefs out there. Many of them are false beliefs and it's very important that, um, we communicate the truth of the gospel and get the truth into the hearts of people. And we understand how false religion, they have taken a lot of biblical words, but they have taught unbiblical concepts. And there are people who they know a lot of religious lingo, but their faith is not in Jesus Christ. And so it's important that we find out where people are coming from, what they are truly trusting in and uh, different people with different backgrounds. They have different hangups. So that's what we're going to be talking about on Sunday. Uh, and I'm really excited about that message. But today I want to kind of take that same concept and apply it to prophecy. When it comes to the subject of Bible prophecy, it's one that all religions are interested in, but unfortunately we don't all speak the same language. We are all English speakers, yet at the same time, we use different words in a very different way. We have different definitions for certain words. And sometimes uh, that's with extra biblical words like rapture like millennium, things like that. These words are not in the scriptures. Doesn't mean the concept isn't there, but that would depend on how you define that word. And so it's the same thing too, though. We often take words that are in the Bible, but we apply a definition to them that sometimes does not line up with scriptures. So that's where it really gets confusing because you've got people using all these Bible terms but they're not using them in the same way. And so we have uh, communication problems. And I deal with this all the time. And it is, this, this is a, a regular thing that I deal with when talking prophecy because in the Baptist world, we have a very dispensational accent when it comes to how we speak. You can often tell what part of the country someone is from by their use of the English language, by their uh, tone, by how they say certain words. And you can tell what part of the country they're from. I was talking, I was standing in line at a youth conference years ago and was talking to an individual and he's like, you don't sound like, and I was in Kentucky and he said, you don't sound like you're from the South. And I said, no, I said, I'm from, I'm from Illinois. And he's like, he's like, I can tell you weren't a Southerner. And he's like, I bet you can't guess which state I'm from. And I said, I'll bet I can guess which state you're from. And he said, what do you think? And I said, Alabama. And he was like, how did you know? And I can spot the Alabama accent, you know, even different states within the South. There's a Georgia accent. There's an Alabama accent. There's a Tennessee accent. You know, there's a Kentucky. Uh, and, you know, and some people, they're really good at identifying these different things. Well, we have accents in Christianity. We have accents in prophecy and by how you use, for, you know, for example, in Arkansas, if there, if somebody uses the word fixing, 
Okay, fixing means I'm getting ready. Like I'm fixing to go to church. I'm getting ready to go to church. In Illinois, if somebody's fixing, they don't, first off, we don't say fixin', we say fixing. And that just means we're repairing something. Okay? It means something completely different. And, but, you know, uh, I, I know what they, I know what they mean. And so we have, when it comes to theology, we all have different accents. And we often reveal what part of Christianity we come from, what world we come from by our use of biblical terms. And, and it is, it's, it's an interesting thing because we all speak English, but we don't all use the words the same. And I would like to refer everyone back to my, um, uh, I've got a series called Back to Bible Prophecy or Back to Bible Terminology. That's what it's Back to Bible Terminology where I talk about a lot of these things. And so we'll probably touch on some of these concepts today, but also another thing we're going to do we are going to go back and we are going to look at some very old writings on prophecy too. Um, one for sure. And maybe another one, if we have time to that, just show how during a different time era, they used certain terms very differently than we do today. Okay. Again, I am from the Baptist world, meaning most of my language. And I hate to admit this, but this is just a reality. Okay. I don't like to admit I have a Northern accent. I don't, I I'm embarrassed when people identify me with Illinois just based on my use of language. Okay. Cause you know, there's nothing proud of to be have an Illinois accent, but I can't get around the fact that I've lived in Illinois my whole life. I've picked up on the accent. And if you're a Baptist, you probably have what I'm going to call a dispensational accent. Okay. And you are using words and terminology and definitions that has been tainted by dispensationalism. And I believe that their language has caused a lot of confusion in the theological world. And so I have made an attempt to, and, and I am still working on it. I am trying to develop a language when it comes to all my theology that is biblical, that is clear, and that communicates the very thoughts that the scriptures are trying to communicate. But it's hard because many times, even when I use biblical words, I'm talking to people with a thick dispensational accent. And as a result, while I'm using these words and I'm trying to use them in a biblical way, they are still hearing these things with that dispensational mindset and we are not i am not communicating the thoughts that are in my mind and getting the same thoughts in their mind and i'm gonna and i'm gonna illustrate that here in a little bit but i want to start off this is the text i'm going to use on sunday but in first corinthians 14 6 this is now brethren i if i come unto you speaking with tongues what shall i profit you except i shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by or by prophesying or by doctrine and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. And so he's illustrating the importance of communicating the right thoughts in people's mind. I can blow a trumpet and I can tell you what that sound means to me, but if that sound doesn't mean the same thing to other people, they are not going to get the message that is in my mind. And so we want to make sure in our communication that we are, that we are communicating the right thoughts into people's minds. And I personally believe the best way to do that is I think we need to use Bible language. But even when it comes to Bible language, many people have misused this language so much for so long that many people are getting the wrong thoughts and ideas in their mind. And I do, I believe we have very faulty language when it comes to Bible prophecy. And proof of that too, and I've illustrated, uh, I've, I've given one of these examples before, but I'm gonna go into it a lot deeper. But many pre-tribbers have embarrassed themselves 
by trying to prove the pre-tribulational doctrine is an old doctrine by using a quote from Ephraim the Syrian or pseudo Ephraim. Okay. They don't even know he wrote it. Okay. It, it, the time Ephraim was written is roughly a 300 year space. So nobody really knows who wrote it, but people are taking a line from there. And I'm going to show you this in a little bit. And here's what's happening. They're looking at the terminology in that one line. That's from a bad translation, by the way, but e either way, but they are using the modern day dispensational definitions for those words and applying that meaning to what was said. But the thing is, if you go and you read everything that is that was written by Ephraim the Syrian, you will see he did not use the, those words, the, those biblical words, the same way dispensationalists use those words. So you cannot. And when you read everything he said, it's like, yeah, this is not what he what he was trying to communicate is not what pre-tribbers are trying to communicate. Absolutely not even close. But hundreds of years ago, they talked very differently than we do today when it comes to prophecy. And another example, if I have time, I'm going to get to, we're going to look at King J the works of King James and how he wrote about prophetic things. And honestly, I have not fully deciphered his use of language when it comes to these things. I'm not 100% sure where he was at on certain things. I'll read some of it to you because I want to show you how it, it's, it's important when we are listening to somebody that just like when given the gospel, if somebody says, I got saved by repenting, okay, well, what does that mean to them? Okay, because a lot of people use that word in a different way. And when it comes to tribulation, when it comes to wrath, when it comes to the coming of Christ, many people define these things differently. When we're talking to someone, how are they using those terms? What thoughts are in their mind? And it's important that we get on the same page in our language. That way we can clearly communicate with one another. And that's just not happening in the, in the biblical world. And so we do, we need to know people's language. We need to learn to recognize the accents. So we know where people are coming from. I had someone call me recently that was confused about their salvation. And this person, they called me up and they started asking a lot of questions. And I noticed based on the questions that they had and based on his accent, literally, I, I, I feel, I feel like I identified his problem. So this person called me and was confused about their salvation because they called on the Lord for salvation. They believe on, they believed on Christ, but they are still struggling with sin. They still have, uh, sinful desires and temptations. And, and this person was expressing how, you know, at one time in their life, you know, they were, they were very immoral and, you know, they, uh, you know, a lot of problems came as a result of that, you know, and they wanted to change their life and turn their life around. And they heard the gospel and they believed it and they called the Lord for salvation, but they, he still had temptations. Okay. And, and so when he's telling me this and I'm listening to his accent, I just asked him, I said, you're from the South, aren't you from down the Bible belt? And he's like, yeah. And I, and, and here's the thing in the South, in the Bible belt, they are really bad about teaching this garbage of, you know, like, uh, and, and putting the idea in people's minds that if you're truly saved, you're not going to struggle with these things anymore. And often young people, they, because they're struggling with sin, they're being tempted with sin. They think they're not saved. It's like, man, I must not have really repented of my sins and all that. And that's what this guy was thinking. He's like, I must not have really got it because I'm still having struggles in these areas, even though the scriptures are very clear. In your flesh dwells no good thing. How to do that which is good, I find not. You know, all the, you know, oh, the Apostle Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? In the Bible Belt, they are really bad at teaching people, or they're failing to teach people about the sinfulness of their flesh that will always be there. They are very bad at teaching people about the new man 
that comes when a person is born again and how we must follow that new man so we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh because those desires of the flesh do not go away. And so when I was able to explain these things to him, I think it really helped. But one of the reasons I knew where to go with this guy, I recognized not his literal, just his literal Southern accent, which did help. Because I'm sorry, Southerners, you're bad at this. Okay, In the Bible Belt, the teaching is terrible on repentance and about salvation. You confuse the daylights out of people. That's why people get saved every year at your camp meetings. And that's another subject for another day, but I just want to take this opportunity to call you out on it. You had this guy is confused as a termite yo-yo. Okay? But also that just too, you know, I'm still struggling with sin. I'm still having these temptations. A, a lot of that is a, is uh, from that camp meeting theology where everybody's wanting this radical transformation. You know, everybody wants this emotional experience where they feel like they get filled with the Holy Ghost and all that. And they got to go back and get their new high every year. And, you know, when you're at a camp meeting and you hear preaching against sin and all that stuff, of course, you don't ever want to sin again when you're in an atmosphere and environment like that. And when somebody's told a bunch of an emotional stories and got you all worked up and all that, but no matter how they get you feeling at that camp meeting, your flesh is still there. And at some point you start giving your flesh what it wants. It's going to keep wanting more and it's going to keep wanting sinful things. And it doesn't mean you're not saved. Your flesh is always rotten. And so, um, but yeah, this person's accent showed me where I needed to go with him. And so we need to learn to identify the accents of people we're talking to when it comes to prophecy. And if you are from the Baptist world, understand you, you are most of the time you're going to be talking to somebody with a thick dispensational accent and dispensationalists massively just destroy the King's English. When it comes to everything, they they're, uh, when they use many extra biblical terms. And when they use biblical terms, they apply false definitions to them. Now, I understand their language, okay? Because I'm from that world, when I listen to a dispensationalist get up and preach, I know exactly what they are trying to communicate. I know exactly what they're communicating. I know I speak their language. Okay. But at the same time too, when I speak, they often do not understand what I'm saying because I use many of the same words that they use that are from the Bible, but I define them differently. And so as a result of that, they get very confused. I just recently spoke with someone who was confused because of my post-tribulational position, okay? But I, and I had to explain to him how I use the word tribulation. I had to explain to him how I use the word wrath. Most dispensationalists, when they hear you say tribulation, seven years goes into their brains. When you say post-tribulational to most, to people with a dispensational accent, they hear the thought that goes in their minds after Armageddon. But that's not what we mean. That's not what we're thinking. We're using the term in a much more biblical way. But we are not communicating the right thought into their mind. And I want to make, and so I think it's very important when you're talking to somebody with a thick dispensational accent that you take some time to define terms. Don't just go saying the right thing okay? in your language. They're not going to understand it. Okay? If I go preach the gospel in English, the right gospel, using all the right terminology to someone who does not speak English, I will accomplish nothing because all my words will not communicate anything into their mind. And so we do. I think we get more confused sometimes because we're all English speakers. We're all using the same words, but we're not using them the same way. We do have extra biblical terms that are causing confusion. We have biblical terms that people are using in an unbiblical way that's also causing confusion. 
So especially when it com comes between the pre-trivers and the post-trivers, we both speak English, but we define our words very differently. And it's the same thing too. And this, this is also an area where I am working on my communication. I am trying to develop a very clear and precise language because when it comes to the amillennialist and the post-millennialist and the pre-millennialist, okay, when it comes to all of those positions, first off, none of the, those words are not in the Bible. The word millennium is not in the Bible. Doesn't mean a thousand year kingdom is not spoken of, but here's what I'm, here's what I'm noticing happening because I do, I listen, I listen to people. That's one thing people like about this program. I will have people from other positions come on and I listen to what they have to say. You know why? Because I'm trying to find out what's in their head. I'm, I'm listening to their words and I'm trying to understand what they are communicating. I want to know what they are thinking. And then I want to judge whether or not it lines up with the scriptures or not, not whether or not it lines up with my theology. I want to know where they're coming from. And here's what I'm finding out in the subject of amillennialism, postmillennialism, premillennialism, all that is that I personally believe that both, both sides are saying a lot of very true things. However, you know, we, there, there's, we're talking past each other in certain areas. And I think that, I think there's air, you know, there are for sure clear areas of difference, but I think we're failing to identify where those are because we're speaking different languages. Okay. We're, we're, we're using some biblical terms, but we're using them in a different way. And I'll, I'll give some examples of that. And so someone who is not real familiar with amillennialism and postmillennialism, I'm, I'm learning their language. I, that way I can under, fully understand what they are communicating and then test it with scripture. And that's one thing that pre-tribbers don't do. Pre-tribbers are not interested in learning our language, even though without a doubt, okay, I do not, I do not believe that on the spirit of prophecy podcast that we have, I mean, we have fully found all truth when it comes to eschatology. I don't believe that. I believe there is still much that we have to learn. I, I think there's areas where we might be right. Not real sure. I think there's areas where we're definitely right. I definitely know, <laughs> not, not, you know, not, not trying to be a jerk or anything. I do know we're a lot closer than the dispensationalists are than the pre-tribbers are, you know, because for sure I can uh, find so many massive flaws in their theology, but I, I don't think we've got it perfect right here. But at the same time, I do, I do want to get to the bottom of the truth. And so as I'm listening to other people, as I read older writings on these subjects, I, you know, I'm learning one of the problems we have is we have a language problem. We, ha we have a terminology problem. And as a result of that, we are often, in, in some cases, both sides are saying a lot of things that are right. And they think they are opposed to each other when they're not. The reality is, though, we are communicating. We're using a lot of the same words, but we're trying to communicate sometimes two different things. Or sometimes we're even trying to communicate the same thing, but we're using different words to do it. And so just some examples of this, too, before we get into some uh, older writings on this subject. Because I, I want to do this, too, to help you learn how to decipher language and how to uh, interpret or translate what people are saying, because that in the preacher world, they have no desire to translate what we're saying. That's why they insist on calling us mid tribbers and will even continue to say that we're teaching a post Armageddon rapture, even though nobody teaches that, but yet they will continue to say that well, like, well, you said post trip. So that means you think this, 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 you know, you think God broke his promises. No, obviously, you know, how the promises are fulfilled. We have a difference in those. And, and we rarely ever talk about the differences 
And it's hard to do that with pre-tribbles. It, there's it's rare exceptions to find a dispensational pre-tribulational person who you can have an intelligent conversation with because they just insist their version of English is the only language in the world that one can speak. And they just get frustrated with you and don't even try. And it would be like me. You know, if I truly have a heart for Spanish speakers, okay, you know, it, it, I'm not just going to go and try to witness to them in English and then get frustrated with them when they don't understand. If I truly have a desire to reach them, I'm not going to force them to learn my language. Well, you know what? Come back and see me when you learn English. No, if I truly have a desire to reach them, I'm going to learn their language. That way I can communicate what is in my heart to their minds, but I'm going to have to learn their language to do it. Pre-tribbers, they just get frustrated and they don't even try to learn our language. They just, you know, and, 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 and the thing, and the thing is too, their language is often wrong. And as, and they've confused others and they've even confused themselves with their own use of language that they got from, you know, Schofield and Darby and Larkin and people like that. And the, and the confusion and the double talk that goes on in their world that we have conclusively proven over and over again in the show, they refuse to repent of it. They refuse to change their language. And I think we all need to be ready to do this. And let me tell you something for pre-wrath, post-trib, pre-wrath, whatever you want to you know, call us on our side, we still have a thick dispensational accent. We still use a lot of dispensational words in a way that's not biblical. And we often, we often are confusing people in our speech. We all know what we're talking about. Okay. When we're in our echo chambers, we all get each other's accent. You know, we all can speak in our own Ebonics amongst each other and we get what we're saying. You feel me? We, you know, we, we, we understand all that, but at the same time, those on the outside, they're hearing a lot of slang. They're hearing a lot of stuff and we're not communicating the right things to them. And I think if we could re repair and develop our language, be more clear, for example, um, our side, you know, we will often bring up, he is not a Jew that is one outwardly. We're the Jews, right? We'll often say that. And when you say we're the Jews, I know what you mean by that. And I agree with you. But then we'll go out, them Jews, they deny that Jesus is the Christ. They're looking for another Messiah. Well, do you realize that we kind of just did some double talk there? Okay, now we all know what we mean. If I listen to one of my preacher friends who, who believes like I do get up and say both of those statements, he has not confused me one bit. I know exactly what he's talking about, but do you realize we probably confuse somebody else. And technically, if he is not a Jew, which was one outwardly, then why are we referring to those out there who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, who deny that Jesus is a Christ, you know, who are only claiming their Jewishness through a bloodline or something like that. Why are we calling them Jews? You know, so again, we can nitpick each other on our language and be like, oh, you know, you're being, you're being picky and, all, and you're, but, and you're being divisive. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to not be confusing. I'm not trying to send conflicting messages. I'm tired of explaining to people certain things, you know, that we shouldn't need to explain. You know, and, and I do, I regularly have to explain to people, listen, when I say post-trib, I mean, after the sixth seal. Okay. And so let's talk about some of these language differences. Okay. Just briefly. And I would encourage you to go back, watch my back to Bible terminology series on this, but here's why I, I do think it is appropriate for me to say post-trib or pre-wrath, even though it does send the wrong message to a lot of people. It does. But that term is very accurate because first off, pre-tribbers hear post-trib, they hear post seven years. They get seven years from Daniel. We do not see the word tribulation in Daniel. Okay. 
we get the term tribulation from the Olivet Discourse. Okay, so if you want to associate the word tribulation with end times events, you're not wrong in doing that. That's a word Jesus used. But Jesus said, after the abomination of desolation, there would be great tribulation. He said, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be turned to darkness. And the moon will not give her light. That's the sixth seal. So how can you, using if we're using Bible terms, claim that the tribulation goes beyond the sixth seal? How can you do that? That's not a that you are not using that word the way Jesus used it. Jesus said after the tribulation. So when the tribulation is done, we have the sixth seal. Okay. Now we still have the trumpets and the vials after that. And I know Clarence Larkin, I know when a dispensationalist says tribulation, they are including the events of the seals, the trumpets and the vials. That's what they mean. I get that. If I hear them talking and saying tribulation, I know what they mean, but they are not using that word the way the scriptures, they're not using that word the way Jesus used that word. So understand their use of the word is wrong. There's no doubt about that. And, and so in our world, when we say post-trib, we don't mean after the trumpets, after the seals. That's not what I mean, because I mean after the sixth seal. That's when Jesus is going to return, and I am post-trib pre-wrath. I believe we're going to be taken out before he pours out his wrath. I don't believe that the seals are his wrath. I don't believe that the seals are judgment, because at the fifth seal, the martyrs the souls of them that were that were killed are saying how long dost thou not judge so why would i call the events of the first five seals the judgment of god when in the scriptures the martyrs in heaven are saying how long dost thou not judge that tells me it's not the judgment of god these are terrible events that are going to take place in the future but it's done at the hand of man. It's done at the hand of the Antichrist. It's natural disasters. These are these, This is not the wrath of God falling on earth. Now when we get to the trumpets and vials, I see the wrath of God falling on earth. So we use the word tribulation different. We use the term wrath differently. I will get up in my church and I'll say, folks, thank God we are not appointed to wrath. Now, what my congregation is going to hear that we're not appointed the trumpets and the vials. Now, but a pre-tribber can get up in that his church and say, folks, we are not appointed to wrath. And his congregation is going to hear, we're not here for any of the tribulation. That's what they're going to hear. But at the same time, okay, while we both said the same thing, our congregations thought two completely different things. So what do we do about this? We've got two people speaking English, saying the same things and commuting Kating, two completely different thoughts. Well, you know what? We've got to reform our language. We've got to reveal the error in their language. And we've done that. Okay. We're right on this. We are right and they are wrong. It's not even a dispute. It's not even a question when it comes to terms like the second coming. Okay. Or the coming of the Lord. Okay. I think if we use that term in a biblical sense, that is what Many would call it the rapture. Okay. First Thessalonians four refers to it as the coming of the Lord. Okay? Now in the dispensational world, they want to call it, they want to use the term rapture and second coming to distinguish the difference between, you know, first Thessalonians four and revelation 19. The problem is that term coming of the Lord is in fact used in places that they would agree are the rapture. But it, but they refuse to call it that because then that's also the term used in Matthew 24. And we're not going to take time to even go through uh, something I, I'm probably going to do in the near future is I do want to take some time to go through passages that we would all agree in the pre-trib and post-trib world are about the rapture, but then use those passages to develop a language and a terminology. 
Okay. And, and, and you're, what you're going to see when we do this, and I'm not going to be playing tricks. If we take these passages that we all agree are about the rapture, you know what we're going to do? We are going to find out that the language is identical to passages that post-tribbers also say are about the rapture, but pre-tribbers say are not. And so I'm telling you, language, using the Bible language the Bible way is going to win the argument for us every time. False teachings, errors are dependent on them being able to use extra biblical terms. I'm not saying you can never say the word rapture, but when you use an extra biblical term, you can apply your own definition to it. But when you use a Bible term, people are automatically going to use it the way the Bible does. And that always messes with faulty theology. It always does. And so if you, when you're wanting to judge who's right on an issue, I would pay very close attention to whose use of the of Bible words align with the Bible the most. And if somebody is avoiding Bible words and they keep using all these extra biblical terms, it's probably because they're in error. So even to Armageddon, okay? People don't use the word Armageddon properly. What most people are talking about when they call the Battle of Armageddon, we don't see that term Battle of Armageddon anywhere in the scripture. You know what we see? The Battle, battle of the Great Day of God Almighty. You say, why does that matter? I don't have time to get into a whole lot why that matters, but let me briefly tell you why calling it the battle of the great day of God Almighty versus the battle of Armageddon is important because the battle of the great day of God Almighty is not fought at Armageddon. It's fought at Jerusalem in the valley of Jehoshaphat, not the Megiddo Valley. That's important. That's significant. That takes us back to some Old Testament passages. It, it, it causes us to make connections that, guess what? Backs up our theology, messes with pre-tribulation theology. I, I think I've posted some videos I've done about that subject from my old channel on this channel, uh, but I, I'm not sure. I probably should do something about that again in the future because that's important. And people are confused about that. And so... Uh, you know, just terms like the millennium. Well, what do you mean by that? Terms, the kingdom. What do you mean by that? Because here, here's what we're having in the, in the uh, amillennial and the premillennial world and postmillennial world where there's some conflict is you have those who will talk about a spiritual kingdom that has come, but then, uh, but then you have those who will talk about a physical kingdom that is to come. I personally believe in both. I believe the kingdom of God has come. I believe we're in it. I believe we're a part of it. I believe we're working in it. We're serving in it. But it, it is. It's, it's all spiritual right now. But I also still believe in a physical kingdom that's, that's going to come as taught by most premillennialists. I, I still believe in that. But I, so the thing is, when I'm listening to an amillennialist speak of certain things about the kingdom, not only do I agree with them many times, but I think often too, a lot of the truths that they are teaching are wonderful truths that in the premillennial world, we are ignoring that I think are very important. And, um, and I think there's been consequences. I think the problem is the premillennialists and amillennialists have been fighting for so long and we're always swinging the pendulum. It's like, we want to make everything physical and ignore the spiritual and they want to ignore the physical and make it all spiritual. And it's like, no, you know what? There's a way to understand both. But here's the, here's the problem. And here's what I'm working on too. As I'm listening to both sides, as I'm, as I'm listening to both sides, I'm realizing, you know what we, what, you know what we have going on here? We have, we have faulty terminology again. It's, we have faulty terminology. We are failing to communicate with each other. And so I am currently working on how to articulate what I believe and how to articulate what the scriptures I believe is clearly teaching, because I think you can find both in the scriptures. I think you can find the spiritual and I think you can find the physical. I, I believe that. And, and I'm said, I, I have some uh, angles that I'm wanting to use to prove that. Um, 
and, and I don't have time to get into that right now, but I think these are important. And it is, it all comes down to communication because often too, you know, in the, in the, in the area of salvation, you know, there's, we all have our own lingo, you know, did you know that not everybody means the same thing when they say born again? Not everybody, not everybody means the same thing. Did you know for some people when they say, oh, oh you're one of those born again, Christians, that means to them, like, you're like one of those radical, I changed my life. I gave up drinking and smoking and all these different things. That's what that means to them. To be born again means you like changed your life. That, that's what that means to them. Okay. Even though being born again means a, it's a spiritual rebirth. Because we have a dead spirit in us as human beings that is, is dead because of our sins. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. We have a dead spirit. And when a person hears the gospel and they believe on Christ, he regenerates that spirit and they are born again spiritually. Okay? It's, not, it's not about a radical transformation in your life. Uh, it's not about a reformation that takes place. Did you know many people change their life, reform their life, give up sin, drinking, sleeping around, and they're still not saved, but people would call them a born again Christian. So again, we we've got there. There's so much Bible terminology that has been hijacked. And so we need to make sure in our attempt to try to lead people our way, you know, or even just win an argument or whatever, we have to communicate the right thoughts in the minds of people. And so learning that, knowing their language, understanding who you're talking to, recognizing their accent, whether that be, man, they got a, they got a thick Ruckmanite accent and, you know, and them, them Ruckmanites, man, you know, they're, they're hard to communicate with they've got some really bizarre language there's a lot of things they say there's a lot of words they use they've got some real crazy things but then you got your normal dispensationalists that are out there you know and and you can't you can you can spot certain people you know you can spot people from the camp meeting world you can spot people from the hiles uh anderson world and and from often people you can tell what Bible college they come from by how they preach, by the language that they use. New IFB people are, are real easy to spot as well. And, and they identify themselves by their language, you know, by how, how they speak of things, you know, where their priorities are, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it, it reveals where they come from. And I think it's, it is, it's very important to understand who you're talking to when it comes to these subjects and real, and just, if we all will recognize people have different languages, different accents that will help us. We have to learn their language in order to communicate. So I want to illustrate something to you that I think, that I think is very interesting and very important because when you read older writings about prophecy. This is one of the things that reveals accents and change of language, okay? Uh, that the old timers, they used a lot of, you know, prophetical lingo differently than we do today. But what we have today is we've got modern people going back and reading excerpts of theirs, and they are applying the modern definitions to those words, okay? We can't do that. And so let me read a, um, let me read a famous quote that pre-tribbers love to talk about. Okay. And listen, every pre-tribber who has ever used E from the Syrian is proof that the pre-tribulation doctrine is old, should be embarrassed. You poly parroted somebody and they made you look stupid. Okay. Because Ephraim the Syrian did not, did not teach a pre-tribulation rapture, but here is an excerpt that is a translation of what he said, but they are applying modern definitions to the lingo, but this is what it says. All the saints and elect of God are gathered together before the tribulation. There it is. Every pre-tribber sees that as like, boom, back in the fourth century, Ephraim the Syrian, he was with us pre-trib 
before the tribulation that, that, that but again so before Daniel's 70th week before the seals before the vials that's what you all just heard if you have that dispensational accent if you speak Larkinese right that's what you just heard right so you can gather before the tribulation which is to come and are taken to the Lord in order they may not see at any time the confusion which overwhelms the world because of our sins. And so they're getting taken out before the tribulation. So they don't have to see all of that wrath that God is going to be pouring out in this world. It's going to be such a terrible time. Car planes crashing, cars running into each other, babies disappearing, thief in the night movie, left behind series. Hey, that's what you all just heard when you read that. Is that what was in Ephraim the Syrian's mind when he said that. Now, let's read. First off, this is another translation, okay? But again, all we have is that one clip. Even if you take that same translation, you read the rest of it, it's still very clear. He was not pre-tribulational like people are today. There, there's no doubt about that if you read all of his writing. And so I'm gonna read a... Uh, 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 not super lengthy excerpt that um, includes this passage, but a, another translation of what he's saying. Now, this other, you say, well, which translation is right? Well, I would say the one that fits the context of everything else he was speaking about. Because that, that one there, again, e even if it's a good translation, when he said before the tribulation, he did not mean what you mean. Again, Pre-tribbers and post-tribbers. We define the term tribulation different than you do. Okay? And it's like, and you need to get a hold of that. If you're going to win post-trib people over, you got to prove your definitions right. And that's not going to happen. But if it, let's just say you are right, you're going to have to prove that to them because they their language is different. So let's listen to what more of what he said. He said, the nations will gather together and come as if they were going to see God. Groups and nations will join him. And every person will renounce their deity. Everyone will say of him to their fellows that they should acknowledge him, the son of destruction. Peoples will fall and peaks of, um, or uh, people will fall upon one another, slaying each other with swords. The elect will flee from his presence to the peaks of the mountains and hills, and there will be calamity on earth, unlike any that came before. That sounds kind of like biblical language. And we're going to, a lot of this terminology used is going to be very familiar, very Olivet Discourse-ish. Okay? Fear will fall upon all people, and they will overcome with terror. Children will renounce their father and follow after the evil one. Priests will abandon their altars to serve as his heralds. People will flee to cemeteries and hide themselves among the dead. They're going to go into the caves. Cemetery, it's the same thing. You know, those caves, a lot of times they were tombs. Hi, say to the mountains, rocks, fallenness. So you can see where this terminology he's using, it's a little different, but it's very closely related to what we see in like the Olivet Discourse. Um, so, so yeah, children renounce their father, people flee to the cemeteries, pronouncing the good fortune of the deceased who have avoided the calamity. Blessed are you, for you were born away to the grave, and hence you escaped from the afflictions. But as for us, woe is us, for when we die, vultures will serve as an escort for us. And if the days of that time were not shortened, the elect would never survive the calamities and afflictions. For our Lord revealed and disclosed to us in his gospel when he said, those days will be shortened for the sake of the elect and of his saints. And when he has harassed the whole creation, when the son of destruction has bent it to his will, Enoch and Elijah will be sent that they might persuade the evil one. Now, let me stop there. Do you all see what's going on here? It says that they were born away to the grave. You know what he's saying? These times are getting so bad. People are are saying, man, they are blessed because they are dead and they don't have to see this affliction that is going on. Would you say, well, that sounds kind of weird, but isn't that consistent too 
with those who are saying to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne. It's going to be so bad when God starts to pour his wrath out that they're going to be like, man, we'd rather be dead than face this thing. But notice Ephraim the Syrian, he is still referring to himself as one of those, you know, those of us who are alive. We are going to see these terrible times. It sounds like he's got the believers going through all of what is to come. It sounds like he's got them going through all of the wrath. It, I mean, from his language, it sure looks like he thought we are going to be here for every bit of it. And again, I would encourage everybody to go read. It's, it's very lengthy. But when you read what Ephraim the Syrian wrote, it, it, it would appear that he believed that we are going to be here for everything and that the return of Christ was something that was going to happen, you know, at the battle, of the great day of God almighty. But folks, there's no rapture before the tribulation here. He is referring to these terrible times that are to come as tribulation in that one translation. But the context of what he is saying about those who escaped the tribulation, who were carried away, it was to death. They weren't caught up alive. No, they died and they didn't have to see all of these terrible things. So again, people are using that as proof. One, it's a bad translation, but even if you want to claim it's a good translation, he did not mean the same thing that you all mean. So let's, let's go ahead and read a little bit more. So with the gentle question, the saints will come before him in order to expose the son of destruction before the assembly surrounding him. If you are indeed God, tell us what we ask of you. Where is the place that you have hidden the elders, Elijah and Enoch? The evil one will respond and say to the saints at that time, when I wish it, they are in the heights. Or again, should I choose, they are within the sea. For I have authority over habitations, since there is no other God apart from me, and I can make anything on earth and also in heaven, they will answer the son of destruction as follows. If you are truly God, call out to the deceased so that they will rise. For it is written, the books of the prophets and the apostles, that when the Messiah reveals himself, he will resurrect the dead from the graves. If you cannot show us this sign, then the one who is crucified is greater than you. For he roused and resurrected those who were dead and was exalted in great splendor. Then the evil one will become enraged with the saints at that time. He will draw his terrible sword and sever the necks of the righteous ones. But Gabriel will arise and descend with Michael as military commanders. They will resurrect those saints while the evil one stands confused with his servants. They will approach and seize that accursed one. And the Lord will rebuke him from heaven. Then he will destroy the accursed one and all his forces. Angels will suddenly approach and cast him into Gehenna. And all of those who believed in him will be thrust into the flames. Then the Lord will come from above in splendor and with a company of his angels. And between earth and heaven, a throne chariot will be fixed there. He will admonish the sea and it will dry up. The fish within it will perish. He will dissolve the heavens and the earth, and there will be only darkness and gloom. He will dispatch fire upon the earth, and it will burn there for 40 days, purifying of iniquity and a pollution of sins. A great throne will be adorned, and the sun will be seated on the right. Now, that sounds post-millennial. Did you all see that? He's got the destruction of the earth by fire. He's got the sea gone. And I saw the new heaven and new earth. First ever heaven and first of the pathway, and there was no more sea. He has all that coming at the coming of Christ. And you say, well, what about Gog and Magog and all that? Um, I'll stick. I, if, if you look at the beginning of his, uh, of his writing, and I believe I, I forgot to, I forgot to save that part, but he references at the very beginning of that writing, Gog and Magog, he associated Gog and Magog in that battle with the final seven years, if you want to call it that. So I'm not here today to promote what Ephraim the Syrian taught about end times, but folks, without a doubt, he had a very 
different picture in his mind of how things were going to play out. He saw believers going through everything spoken of in Matthew 24. Everything. He had them going through a time of wrath and experiencing everything that is going to come upon the world. And then he had Jesus coming back with his angels and the new heaven and the new earth starting. That's what he had. He wasn't, folks, he wasn't even premillennial. Yet dispensationalists, he's like their poster child. So uh, he wasn't even in the same ballpark. He spoke a completely different language than we do today. And you know what? I'm not here to argue whose language is better, whose thoughts were better. But the thoughts in Ephraim the Syrians' minds are not the thoughts that are in the minds of pre-tribbers and post-tribbers and those with a dispensational accent. He used a lot of the same words, but he didn't use them in the same way that we do. Being born away to death? We don't say it that way. We believe in being caught away without death to heaven. When we're, when we're talking about the rapture, that, you know, that that's what we mean when we talk about that. But he, he says nothing that seems to allude to any kind of rapture like we speak of. So Ephraim the Syrian is not where I get my doctrine, but he is evidence that he spoke a very different language and pre-tribbers have embarrassed themselves by applying their faulty definition, their modern definition, their dispensational language. They have applied those meanings to his writings when he, without a doubt, did not think that way. He did not believe that way. So we see that with all the old timers. The language that most of us are speaking is heavily influenced by dispensationalism, and that includes us non-dispensational post-drivers. And so we it gets confusing sometimes. We've got to work on our language. And let me go ahead and read. Some, uh, let me read a little bit of this works of King James because this is interesting. I find it fascinating reading from people who are not tainted by dispensationalism. Doesn't mean I think that they were probably more right, but it is very interesting to see how the words of God affected their thinking because the words of God are not affecting our thinking in the same way today because our language has been tainted by the dispensationalists. And, and I believe it's caused a lot of confusion. So let me try to read some of this to you. It's hard to read because this is in the old Gothic uh, font and, and you all know how hard that is to read, but uh, I'll start reading because he starts out um, basically, he kind of does like his own translation of Revelation 11. So, but he also includes some commentary in here. So I'll start, uh, re so he's talking about who shall tread down the holy city for the space of two and 40 months. Now, lest I should despair of any profit, which my successors could have made in doctrine in their time, because as it appeareth, by the fixed, uh, by the first trumpet, the whole world should be subdued to these two monarchies. Um, and again, bear with me. I know how to read, but I'm, I'm trying to read this Gothic print. So, uh, Christ shall allure me. Uh, some should still remain pure and unspotted as also to show me and by me to forewarn the church that this most dangerous monarch called Apollyon should corporally succeed in the church and should sit in the temple of God gives me a reed for that cause and commands me to measure the temple for he will save all them that are of the true church for they are the inward parts of the temple. And the rest by reason of their hypocrisy shall be accounted of as Gentiles. And this division shall be made by my successors in doctrine of whom I spake already. For they by the measure and trial of the word signified by the reed shall separate that holy sanctum sanctorum from the rest of the outward temple of God to wit the hypocritical and anti-Christian church which shall tread down and persecute the true church for the space of 
uh, two and 40 months or three years and a half for it is both one number. This space prescribed by Christ alluded to Daniel's prophecy of two times a time and half a time for as Daniel meant thereby the half of this prophetical week. So Christ means by this that the persecution of this destroyer shall last the half to wit. It shall uh, reign about the midst of the last age of this whole week, which begins at his incarnation and first coming and ends at his last coming again, which because of the last period, it is here compared to a week. But I shall give that holy town to two witnesses of mine who clothed with sackcloth shall prophesy the space of 1,203 score days for these, my successors, he shall raise up as witnesses to wit sufficient number of them for out of the mouth of two or three witness, every word is confirmed. And so I'm going to stop reading right there, but uh, while that might be a little confusing to you, if you, if you read what King James wrote about the book of revelation, understand he also had a very different language than we do. And some of you got confused when I was reading that because he clearly did not look at the words of revelation 11, the way we do in from the, with a dispensational accent. He did not do that at all. He sees it clearly as, you know, when they're measuring the temple in heaven, this is very symbolic. Okay. In the pre millennial world in the dispensational world, we see that as another temple again, that's going to be built in Jerusalem and the antichrist, you know, basically the Gentiles treading it down. King James seemed to think that this was symbolic of a three and a half year period of time where the Antichrist, this monarch is a term he used, Apollyon, is going to be persecuting the true church. And it's going to be done through the fake church, which you can see too in his writings. He's referring to the Catholic church is, is what he believed. And he, I think it seems pretty clear he believed that the Antichrist was the Pope. And so it, it appears, and I could be wrong because King James used different language than we use, but it would appear that when it comes to Daniel's 70th week, he put the first half at Christ's first coming and the second half is going to take place at his second coming. That's what, it, that, that, that's what it appears to him. And so he, it looks like that he thinks there's just a three and a half year period that is to come where the antichrist is, and that's a term I'm using, is making war with the saints or the true church. And so, uh, when it, so when they're going after the temple, that's not, not them going after a physical temple in Jerusalem, but going after believers in the true church. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think that might be a good interpretation of revelation chapter 11. It, it is, but we're all confused when we hear that. Because we are all tainted by modern teachings. And when you go in different time periods, they saw all these things in a very different way. And it's fascinating to read their writings and to listen to what they said. And you do. You have to learn their terminology. If you see them say before the tribulation, don't assume that they are using Larkin's definition of the term tribulation. They're, Ephraim the Syrian was not. So it's the same thing today within the different camps in the pre-trib and the post-trib world in the amillennial, premillennial, post-millennial world. We all have our ways we use language. And it's so important that if we actually want to win, if you are so sure you are right, I mean, your theology, it is sound across the board. Your terminology is 100% biblical. You know, okay. That's fine. But remember, when you're talking to people in these other camps, your words will not communicate the same thoughts in their minds. So if you actually are going to engage, if you are going to try to win them over, you know what you need to do? You need to learn their language. You need to find out where they're coming from. You need to, you need to find out what they mean when they say something. And you know what you shouldn't do? You shouldn't take the words that they're saying and then say they're teaching something that they're not trying to teach. 
And pre-tribbers do that when they teach that we teach we're getting raptured at Armageddon. We're going up and coming right back down. Nobody's teaching that. Nobody's teaching that. But what they're doing is they are taking our language. They're taking our words, but they're translating it into their pre-tribulational gibberish is what they're doing. But that's not how we use those words. And so I think everyone, where, wherever you land, one thing we should all work on doing is communicating in a way that is the most biblical, but also clear. I think we need to use biblical terms. I think we need to speak the way the Bible speaks. And if we, and if we do that, and then we got to be clear when we're talking to people, let's define our terms and let's define them using the scriptures. And I believe if we do that, I think we'll clear up a lot. I think we'll clear up a lot of stuff and I think we will have less confusion and we all need to work on this area. Okay. Post-trib, post-trib pre-wrath people. When we are in our bubble, we know what we're talking about. There's no, there's no confusion in my church when I get up and I speak with a post-tribulational accent. Okay. There, there's no confusion. If I am around the new IFB world and I, I can, I can get up and I can preach with a new IFB accent and I will communicate, I can communicate to those people exactly what is in my mind okay? because I know their language. I know their accent, but if I'm preaching to an old IFB, a dispensational crowd, am I, do I, is it, is it beneficial for me to get up and to start speaking in a new IFB in a language and a new IFB accent only to confuse the daylights out of these people. No, you know what I've got to do? I've got to go and I've got to do one of two things. I can either butcher the King's English and go speak their language and maybe communicate the right thing. Or, cause I don't, I don't want to misuse Bible language. What I will, what I will need to do. I will need to take the time to teach them some language. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to explain to them. Here's what I mean. When I say post-trib, here's what I mean. Okay. Your replacement theology. Well, what does replacement theology mean to you? If it means the old Testament replaced the new Testament. Okay. But if it means that God replaced the Jews with the Gentiles, well, that's garbage. I, I don't believe that. So again, we, you know, we've got to make sure we figure out how to communicate these things in a right way. And if, if we do that, I think, you know, we will, we'll make some real difference Be, because in the pre, in the pre wrath world, okay. In the world that I come from, I do believe while I don't believe I'm not arrogant enough to think our doctrine is perfect. I think we're doing pretty good. Uh, I, I, I really do, but, uh, here's where I do think we need to work. And that is on our language, on our, on our terminology. I don't think we are doing the best job in always communicating things to people and understand too. I have had, uh, even not that long ago, I had someone call me who had been studying the Bible on his own and he had, um, basically came to the same position that I hold. And, um, but at the same time too, when I was talking to him, you know, he had, he had different terminology and he had watched after the tribulation and he, he thought he agreed with it, but he wasn't completely sure. Now here's, here's why, because again, while the thoughts in his mind were aligned, you could, in many ways you could say with ours, his language wasn't quite the same yet. And so when I explained the language to him, he's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I believe. But he had a different terminology. You know why? Because he had not been running in the same circles, you know, as a lot of the post trippers. So he had a different accent, but he, but he was communicating the same thing. He had a different accent. He had a slightly different language, but we were on, we were on the same page. And so I, I, I think everybody should be getting what I'm saying. 
I think we all get what I'm saying. And I'm not here today declaring a new language, a new terminology. Here's what I, here's my hope for everyone, whether you agree with me or disagree with me on end times, let's acknowledge the fact that we do all have a language that we do all have an accent and sometimes our language does not, um, our use of language does not completely align with the scriptures. And as a result of that, we are causing confusion in that. And we often are talking past each other and that is not profitable. We're speaking into the air. So if you want to win me over and you, you feel like you've got the goods, you know, it all, then it, it will help a lot if you learn my language and you can maybe show where I'm misusing certain terms and certain language. And then, and then we can at least get on the same page. We could at least know what you're thinking. I had a couple different times last uh, week when we were in new Orleans witnessing where I started talking to people, you know, and they know enough English when they answer or say hello, but then they're like, Hey, you know, we're from Liberty Baptist church, you know, going through the spiel and, uh, you know, or, uh, we were with the uh, same faith Baptist church. We're faith Baptist church. I want to invite you to church. And, um, you know, and then they would just like, so for example, then I asked, Hey, you know, if you died, you know, for sure, if you're going to go to heaven and they're like today. And I realized they thought when I was asking if they knew for sure if they're going to go to heaven, they thought I was asking, do you want to go to church? You know, and that wasn't what I was trying to ask at all. And so when I say, you know, has anybody ever showed you how you can know for sure if you're going to go to heaven? And he thinks I'm saying, do you want to go to church today? I'm probably not going to be able to get that guy saved because he does not, I don't know his language and he obviously does not know my language. We are not going to be able to communicate. And so we're, I'm speaking into the air at that point. And thankfully, you know, we had some Spanish tracks for some of the people There was a lot of Vietnamese people down there, pastor major. They had some uh, business cards with some uh, Vietnamese stuff on it. We were able to give those to them. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to get on the same page. And I think we all need to work on that. If w whether we are trying to oppose, even if we're just trying to oppose someone, let's make sure we actually understand their position. And part of that is understanding their language. And so I would encourage everyone learn their language. If you want to win people over, learn their language on prophecy, learn their prophetic language. It'll make a big difference. And then you develop a language, develop one that is biblical, develop one that is clear, one that does not conflict in its communication. And I believe if we do that, we will be effective in our attempt to spread the truth. So I hope this was a help to you. And I hope you got, you got a blessing out of this. Let's all help me work on more biblical terminology and and clear language when it comes to these things and we are still in the process of developing some of these things i want to be as clear as i possibly can in what i believe so thank you so much for watching this i hope it was a blessing god bless you and we will see you all next time